In this video, I wanted to go over the history of Illyria Windrunner, all the way from her beginning to Shadowlands, which is the most recent interaction that we have with her. In Dragonflight, we don't see a whole lot of her yet, but maybe in the future? With that said, let's get into it. Illyria emerged into the world as the firstborn child of Larissa Windrunner, the esteemed Ranger General of Silvermoon, and Varith Windrunner, who held the significant role of Chief Advisor to Anastirian Sunstrider. Her name paid homage to her maternal grandmother's legacy. Alongside her sisters Sylvanas and Verissa, she also shared her life with a younger brother named Lyrith. Destined to continue the Windrunner lineage, she was groomed to inherit her mother's position as Ranger General. Yet, she harbored a spirited disdain for the traditional confines and expectations of the High Elves. The path set by her mother was met with unwavering resistance by Illyria. Restless within the stasis of Quoth Loss, she yearned for exploration, longing to engage with diverse races, embrace various cultures, and rekindle ties with the humans who once aided them during the Troll Wars. Larissa remained staunchly dedicated to the Elven isolationism, believing Quothalas held the utmost importance and dismissing any lingering obligation to the humans. A pivotal moment arrived as she embarked on the demanding hunt to prove herself as Larissa's heir. Tasked with tracking down the formidable spring pawn named Mahler, she ventured into the wilds of Eversong Forest. Tragedy struck as she confronted the beast, becoming the hunted herself. In an act of valor, her sister Sylvanas intervened, depriving her of the chance to claim her own victory. The discord between her and her mother escalated over time, exacting a toll on the Farstriders, which is the elite order of Blood Elf Rangers led by Larissa. She sought solace with her companions, deepening the divide between those who shared her beliefs and Larissa's loyal adherents. A climactic confrontation led her to relinquish her claim to the Ranger General title and propose Sylvanas as her successor. With Lorthamar and Haldurin's support, Sylvanas assumed the mantle, a choice begrudgingly accepted by Larissa. The eldest Windrunner was granted the task of venturing beyond the kingdom's borders to establish a presence. Before her departure, she mended her bond with her mother and cherished a final serene evening with her family. Larissa gifted her a necklace adorned with an emerald, a ruby, and a sapphire, a cherished keepsake. Departing Quothalos, she embarked on her journey alongside her loyal ranger companions, Verana, Relian, Aruk, and Tathrasar. Their quest was to explore the world beyond their homeland's borders. During her absence, tragedy struck the Windrunner family as Larissa and Varith fell victim to the Orcish Horde during a diplomatic mission. The Farstriders grappled with the choice of Sylvanas or her as their leader, reflecting divided loyalties, uniting their cause and silencing dissent. United once more, the Windrunner sisters confronted the looming threat of the Horde and Quothalas' uncertain stance. While Sylvanas grappled with the intricacies of elven politics, she was unburdened by such constraints. She would march to the danger rising in Lordaeron, with or without the full support of her homeland. As the Horde's ominous presence cast its shadow over Lordaeron, the resolute Tyrannus Minethel invoked the age-old debt the Sunstriders owed the Arathi lineage, rallying support in the name of Anduin Lothar. Quothalas' ruling council, perceiving the Horde more as a pretext to honor that debt rather than a genuine peril, dispatched a modest contingent of elven forces to bolster the alliance of Lordaeron. Amidst this deliberation, she stood as one of the rare voices in Quothalas, understanding the real threat that the Horde posed to her people. Driven by this conviction, she defiantly led her rangers to South Shore, aligning herself with the alliance of Lordaeron, despite the absence of official orders. Side by side with Turalyon and Khadgar, she fervently engaged in the campaign to expel the encroaching orcs from Lordaeron's soil. News of the Horde's wanton destruction along Quothalas' borders ignited a resolute fire within her. Guiding the Alliance's forces, she rallied to the defense of Silvermoon City, experiencing an emotional reunion with her sister Sylvanas, as well as companions Lorthamar Theron and Haldoran Brightwing. Though Sylvanas now held the mantle of Ranger General in her stead, Sylvanas entrusted her with Larissa's bow, Thazdara, recognizing her elder sister's capacity to seek retribution on the front lines. In the company of Lorthamar, she stood beside Turalyon during the relentless siege of Capital City. A turning point arrived as the Horde, their resolve waning, retreated to the south. With the threat momentarily quelled, she and Lorthamar embarked on their return to quell the loss. Triumph over the Horde was attained, but the victory was marred by a grievous toll. Eighteen of her kin, including her cherished younger brother Lyrith, fell in the struggle. Grief-stricken, she sought solace in the arms of Turalyon, eventually bearing his child, Erator. 
Section 3. Beyond the Dark Portal To the dismay of her companions, a shadow enveloped her. After 18 of her kin, including her younger brother, whom she wanted to protect more than anyone, were killed, she was filled with the bloodlust to exterminate the orcs. Now, she saw them as nothing but vile pests in need of eradication. She made a vow of retribution and set out on an unyielding quest for revenge, guiding her and a select group of rangers through human territories in an unceasing chase of rogue orcs from the Bleeding Hollow clan. As two years elapsed since the war's conclusion, she stood within another guard's confines, Cadgar revealing the ominous expansion of the portal's rift and the resurgence of the Alliance army's necessity. Tasked with a reluctant duty, she journeyed to Stormwind, intent on forewarning Turalyon. Amidst these events, she had already welcomed her son Erator into the world. A powerful memory was imprinted in her mind as she saw her young son in the Stormwind Keep courtyard, brandishing a wooden sword against a frog and inadvertently striking a pillar. While another mother might find the sight endearing, it weighed on her heart with a sad wisdom she had to explain to Erator the harsh reality of war. With the rallying of orcs under the banner of Nerzul and the emergence of Death Knights, she resolved to lead her rangers through the Dark Portal into Draenor. Driven by her unquenchable thirst for vengeance and a desire to halt the Horde's malevolent march, as her departure loomed, she transformed her cherished necklace into three distinct fragments. The emerald remained in her possession, while the ruby and sapphire journeyed to Verisa and Sylvanas, respectively conveyed by Verana, her trusted lieutenant. In swift response to the renewed peril, the Alliance orchestrated an expedition into Draenor, bestowing upon her the rank of captain as she embarked upon this new chapter. Within Draenor's harsh landscapes, an epiphany struck her, prompting her to release the shackles of hatred and mourn her cherished ones lost to the ravages of war. This transformative moment occurred as Turalyon commanded her to remain behind, but her resolute spirit could not permit the sacrifice of a young human's life. Their souls rekindled the deep connection, much to the solace of their comrades. As fate progressed, her journey became linked to the downfall of Hellfire Citadel, where she placed her trust and her forces in the hands of reliable allies. Accompanied by Cadgar and Turalyon, she embarked on a quest to retrieve the Skull of Gul'dan from the clutches of Deathwing. Moments of valiant defense and unwavering resolve followed, culminating in Cadgar's sealing of the last dark portal, and shrouding Azeroth in tranquility as Draenor succumbed to a cataclysmic upheaval. In a desperate bid for survival, she and her surviving allies entered a rift to the enigmatic Twisting Nether. Presumed to have met her fate, she and her valiant companions were hailed as heroes, their noble sacrifice eternally honored. A tribute to her valor stands prominently within the Valley of Heroes, a grand statue gracing the gates of Stormwind City, a testament to the indomitable spirit that burned within her. Section 4. A Thousand Years' War Illyria and Turalyon found themselves in an unfamiliar corner of Draenor, a realm entwined with the volatile twisting nether as the world neared its demise. Lothraxian, a once loyal member of the Burning Legion turned warrior of the Army of the Light, emerged to their aid. The celestial being disclosed that they were destined to fight against the Legion, and his quest was to locate them. The Legion dispatched a relentless assassin to extinguish their lives. Swift and decisive, Illyria repelled the assassin's threat, her triumph witnessed by the Naru Zira, who appeared before them. The Naru, harbinger of prophecy, disclosed a grim revelation. Although the Legion faltered in their prior endeavor to invade Azeroth, their insidious designs would soon find fruition. Driven by a longing to embrace their son Erator once more, her resolve materialized in a plea to Zira, urging her to send them back to Azeroth to rally its fractured nations against its eminent darkness. Zira, voicing skepticism, cautioned them that their support would prove insufficient. However, fate's intricate threads intertwined, binding her and Turalyon to a higher purpose, the unearthing of the Emerald Star. A celestial artifact capable of vanquishing the Legion for eternity. Conceding to the pressing urgency of Zira's mandate, the loyal pair ventured through a portal, joining the vanguard of the Army of Light. Bound by purpose, Turalyon and Illyria honed their prowess aboard the ethereal vessel known as the Xenadar, navigating the arcane currents of the Army's dimensional ship. In a transformative ritual, Zira infused Turalyon with the boundless light, gifting him with immortality. In a touching twist of fate, Illyria's communion with the light facilitated a momentary connection with her past, granting her a glimpse of a solemn ceremony within Stormwind City's Valley of Heroes. Through the radiant channel, she sensed her son's presence and was able to send her feelings to him. Young Erator looked around and smiled, and then reached out to her statue. 
a subtle connection that traversed time and distance. Now in the wiki it doesn't say exactly how she was able to sense her son, but I'm guessing it was due to while Turalyon was being imbued with the light by Zira, she was close enough that she was able to sense Erator and send her feelings to him, letting him know that she was watching out for him and she's still around somewhere in the cosmos. Amidst their valiant endeavors, the Army of the Light ventured upon a desolate prison world, only to uncover an unsettling void that eradicated the demons entrenched within. Amidst the chaos, Illyria fell prey to the void and was infected with it, becoming a vessel for unsettling visions. A kinship with the void ignited, and she pleaded with Lothroxian for him to tell her all he knew of the void. She learned of the enigmatic Locust Walker, unveiling the intricacies of the void's paradoxical existence a cryptic tapestry of light and shadow, truth and falsehood. Her quest expanded, her thirst for knowledge centered on the elusive Locust Walker and others of his kind, much to the trepidation of her celestial overseer. As the sands of time continued to cascade, the Burning Legion's vile grasp enshrouded the remnants of Draenor, now Outland. Within the timeless embrace of the Twisting Nether, over five centuries passed for her, while mere decades elapsed on Azeroth. Prophecy fulfilled, she stood at the precipice of destiny, recounting her vision of traversing the legion-infested Argus, where the Emerald Star's secret dwelled. Zira, recognizing the opportune moment, dispatched her and Turalyon on a fateful voyage to uncover the enigmatic truth of the Emerald Star. A whispered confession resonated between the two, as she disclosed that her visions stemmed not from the light, but from an unsanctioned force that defied Zira's teachings. In this instance, Turalyon was willing to accept any help to fight the legion, since he trusted Illyria's instincts more than the teachings from Zira about not using the Void. Navigating the formidable landscapes of Argus, her consciousness was struck by revelation, an ethereal transmission from the Titan world soul bound to the heart of the dying world. The Emerald Star's insidious nature unfurled, resurrecting the Legion's fallen under its dark shield. At this crucial crossroads, Turalyon's unwavering vow to liberate the world's soul from the Legion's grasp was witnessed. His sincere promise, voiced as the fabric of destiny unfolded, resonated deeply. Enveloped by the cacophony of battle, a dire confrontation unfolded, demons converging upon her and Turalyon's transport, an onslaught bordering on inescapable defeat. In the crucible of chaos, she summoned the forbidden might of the void, a shadowy rift cleaving the veil between worlds. An agonizing separation unfolded as Turalyon, an embodiment of light, felt his essence torn asunder while her grasp pulled him into a distant realm. Grief and uncertainty painted their final exchange, as tearful hands recoiled from a searing touch, entwined in Farewell's bittersweet embrace. The fleeting portal succumbed to the shadows, transporting her to the unknown, and leaving Turalyon engulfed in a torrent of emotions. Thus captured, she found herself ensnared within the Legion's clutches, imprisoned on Niskara, a world suspended in the chaotic void. A most unexpected companion surfaced, the enigmatic Locust Walker. Through resilience and unity, they vanquished their captors, invoking the void to forge an escape. As darkness yielded to void, her journey of mastery began, navigating her consciousness through the shadowy expanse. An alliance with the Locust Walker ensued, imparting wisdom on the harmony between light and shadow the enigmatic equilibrium that shaped reality's multi-dimensional tapestry. Yet her passion took over her originally planned destiny. A vision seized her, a vision of Turalyon locked in a sinister embrace with an Eridar, embroiled in an imminent confrontation for his very soul. Bolstered by her newfound connection, her yearning to intervene clashed with the Locust Walker's teachings. A tumultuous clash took place, culminating in her decisive strike, prematurely ending her training. Tempers flared and Locust Walker deemed her act cowardice, one marked by predictable imperfection. Amidst their bitter exchange, an unexpected revelation happened. The shadowy alliance she sought to thwart, a force that defied the light and shadow, emerged anew. A rival power entwined in enigmatic destiny. Fueled by determination, she descended upon the scene, vanquishing the perilous assassin who sought to rend her husband's essence. The void yielded her formidable strength cleansing Turalyon's soul from nefarious toxins. As the confrontation escalated, Zira's luminous presence manifested, presiding over the climactic juncture. Turalyon and Lothroxian's impassioned plea softened her resolve, offering a glimmer of leniency. Yet her unyielding allegiance to the Void caused her incarceration, 
an ordeal that etched the final chapter of her odyssey. Section 5, Warlords of Draenor A cowled ranger occasionally graces the thresholds of players' garrisons, weaving a tale of intrigue. She extends a formidable challenge to the player, tasking them with a quest of paramount importance. The retrieval of elusive high elf weaponry, epitomized by the elusive silver-lined arrow. This coveted relic, steeped in mystique, is rumored to reside within the treacherous depths of the void-ravaged expanse known as the Shadow Moon Burial Grounds. As the player braves the perils of the burial grounds, unraveling the threads of darkness in pursuit of the puzzling arrow, the ranger's intentions gradually come to light. She reveals that the silver-lined arrow may have had a connection to Illyria, and hoped that somehow the twisting nether would bring Illyria to alternate Draenor. While that wasn't the case, and Illyria wouldn't be seen until we venture to Argus in the Legion expansion, it was the first hint of both Illyria's eventual return and her connection to the Void. Section 6 The Legion Amidst years of relentless quests, the elusiveness of her whereabouts finally gives way to a beacon of possibility. The shadows part, unveiling a trail leading to a captured demon, ensnared within the relentless grasp of the Far Strider's interrogation. In the midst of anguish and chaos, the demon's bold admission reveals a grim reality, her existence as a captive, held in the sinister grip of Inquisitor demons on the desolate portal world of Niskara. With unwavering determination, Verisa Windrunner forges an unbreakable alliance with the Far Striders, uniting their strengths to track down the matriarch of the Windrunner legacy. A determined journey begins to take shape, composed of brave hearts working to free Illyria from the Legion's grasp before it is too late. The stakes are high, for the Legion's greedy eyes have turned to Illyria's legendary bow, Thaz Dara, a weapon of fabled might that threatens to amplify the Legion's dominance. While the echoes of battle sounding again, and Thaz Dara is rekindled, they eventually make it to Nascara and locate her bow, but Illyria is nowhere to be found, a wisp in the shadows. Verisa's tenacity prevails, birthing the conviction that Illyria, a phoenix of resilience, has defied her captors, fleeing the abyss to chart her path anew. And so the hunt perseveres, a timeless odyssey to reunite the fragmented Windrunner legacy. Amidst the cosmic upheaval, a beacon of light emerges. The radiant presence of Thaz Dara serves as testament to her enduring spirit. Hope ignites anew by the notion that she endured the cataclysmic fall of Draenor, persisting as a vigilant sentinel against the encroaching darkness. In the Chronicles of the Twisting Nether, Verisa envisions her as a celestial hunter, chasing the very essence of malevolence into its realm an eternal saga of valor and retribution. Section 7, Argus Just as the Zenidar was about to be shot down in Argus, Illyria's whereabouts were shrouded in uncertainty, with her last known location being a prison cell. Despite this, Trallian held an unwavering belief in her survival. His faith was soon rewarded when Illyria emerged to aid him and an adventurer from Azeroth in vanquishing Agonar who was a pit lord who resided in Outland before being killed at the pools that were once sacred springs the Draenei had used until Akinar was killed, and his blood corrupted the pools into what is now known as the Pools of Akinar in Outland. After defeating Akinar, a heartfelt reunion with her son Erator took place aboard the Vindicar. Illyria expressed that every decision she and Turalyon had made was to ensure his safety, and their separation had been a heart-wrenching ordeal. With their family now reunited, Illyria made a solemn vow to prevent any future separation. When Verisa revealed to Illyria that Sylvanas was now the war chief of the Horde, she was in disbelief. The Horde's past actions against their people made this revelation hard to swallow. The fact that Sylvanas was now undead was another shocking truth that Verisa was hesitant to disclose. Deciding that such a conversation was best held in private, Verisa postponed the discussion. Verisa also shared the heroic deeds of the Huntmaster of the Unseen Path who was the player character who completed the quest to acquire Thaz Dara, which is Illyria's bow she lost while she was a captive, during the mission to rescue Illyria on Nascaria. Illyria later personally thanked the Huntmaster for their bravery. She acknowledged that while she might need Thaz Dara back one day, the Huntmaster's skillful handling of it brought honor to the weapon and its previous owners. As her own path was diverging, she gave her blessing to the Huntmaster to continue wielding it with pride. The decision was made to retrieve Zira's body, who is the Prime Naru, from the fallen Zenidar but Illyria expressed her apprehension about retrieving the rest of Zira's body from the Zenidar central chamber, fearing the possibility of imprisonment. Despite her fears, she assisted Turalyon in the task. After retrieving Zira's body, she was present on the Vindicar when Illidan's Stormrage rejected and killed Zira. Turalyon, filled with rage, attempted to strike Illidan down, 
while Illyria was taken back by Illidan's immense power to destroy the Prime Naru. Sometime later, during a meeting with Khadgar, Illyria and Turalyn were informed that Danath and Kurdrin were still alive. Despite his busy schedule, Khadgar expressed his desire to see them more often. They agreed that once the battle was over, they would hold a reunion feast for the Sons of Lothar. Illyria insisted that it was Khadgar's turn to buy the drinks. Upon discovering that the Crest of Knowledge, a piece of the Crown of the Triumvirate, was inside the Seat of the Triumvirate on Eridath. Now real quick, a quick mention of what those things are. The Crest of Knowledge is an item containing vast knowledge cultivated by the ancient Eridar. The Crown of the Triumvirate is an ancient relic of the Eridar people of Argus, which was crafted thousands of years ago by the Triumvirate, consisting of Velen, Kil'jaeden, and Archimond. Finally, the Seat of the Triumvirate is where the Triumvirate ruled over Argus. Illyria shared her findings about the area. She revealed that the darkened Naru, Lura, had become a beacon, attracting the Shadow Guard Ethereals to use her void energies for their own purposes. Illyria and an adventurer journeyed to the ruins of Eridath, where they encountered Krogol being forcefully infused with the void by the Ethereals. They also met Illyria's mentor, Locust Walker, who was investigating the Shadow Guard's activities on Argus. Locust Walker questioned Illyria about her use of shadow magic, especially given Turalyon's affinity for the light. Illyria retorted that without the light, there is no shadow. Upon vanquishing the Ethereals of the Shadow Guard incursion, Locust Walker deemed Illyria worthy of another chance to chase her destiny. In a fierce battle with the Void Revenant, Nalathoth, Illyria emerged victorious, and Locust Walker retrieved the creature's heart, presenting it to Illyria who consumed it. Locust Walker imparted wisdom to Illyria, assuring her that as long as she remained control over her mind, she could harness the power of the Void. He hinted to the possibility of revealing his own mastery over the Void someday before departing. Their paths crossed again within the enigmatic Seat of the Triumvirate. Amidst the clash with Lura, Locust Walker urged Illyria to tap into the power of the Void Rifts that the darkened Naru was opening. This led to a pivotal moment where Illyria absorbed Lura's essence, undergoing a transformation into a Void state. Recognizing the need to explore the boundaries of her newfound power, Illyria and Locust Walker exited the seat. Later, aboard the Vindicar, Illyria affirmed her control over her new form, demonstrating her ability to switch it on and off at will. Following the imprisonment of Sargeras by the Pantheon at the seat of the Pantheon, Illyria's heart yearned for her return to Azeroth, to be reunited with her family and to once again witness the verdant forests of her homeland. Yet a sense of dread clouded her anticipation of meeting Sylvanas. She was compelled to see for herself the transformation of her sister. She questioned whether Sylvanas was still the sister she knew, or had become a creature forsaken by the light. Illyria acknowledged her own transformation, aware that her command over new powers might raise doubts about her loyalties. With much to contemplate, she resolved to remain composed and focused. Section 8 Three Sisters Strolling hand in hand through the storied Valley of Heroes within Stormwind, Illyria and her beloved Turalyon embarked on a journey both physical and emotional. Amidst the tranquil hush of the surroundings, Illyria shared revelation that held profound significance. A family reunion, a gathering of Windrunners, beckoned on the horizon, almost suspended between hope and uncertainty. It was an endeavor fueled by a yearning to unravel the intricacies of their shared bond after the trials of time, and to reconnect with her long-lost sisters. She made a firm decision within herself, a strong resolve to let go of past trouble and find out if family bonds could withstand the stormy waves of change. Illyria bore a precious relic, a token that transcended both time and space. An emerald Windrunner locket, a tangible symbol of unity forged in Stormwind and bestowed upon her sisters. As she stood at this crossroads, the weight of her own choices and the haunting echoes of the Void murmured through her thoughts. The locket, an embodiment of shared heritage, whispered a tale of past, present, and the potential future that lay before them. With grace and purpose, Illyria conjured a portal of void energy, bidding Turali in a heartfelt goodbye. She left with him a message for Erator. In the event that she didn't come back from this meeting with her sisters expressing her love, all the while resisting the sinister whispers in her mind that urged her to abandon her affection for Turalyon and end his life. The meeting of sisters began with Verisa, or Little Moon, a cherished endearment that encapsulated the bond they shared. Golden tresses danced in the wind as Verisa playfully dubbed Illyria Lady Sun, a poignant juxtaposition that mirrored their past and the uncharted territories that lay ahead. The camaraderie, once forged in shared laughter and dreams, painted vivid strokes of reminiscence across their conversation. A dance of words wove tales of alliances and betrayals, 
of Horde and Alliance, of battles fought and love lost. After they talked, the two had to meet Sylvanas. They embarked on a journey to the eerie Ghostlands. Here, Sylvanas recounted the tale of Arthas Menethil, who led the Scourge to devastate the kingdom of Quel'Thalas. The Windrunner sisters were given skeletal horses by Sylvanas, aiding their mission to purge the undead they encountered en route to their ancestral home, Windrunner Spire. During their journey, they engaged in a game, One is a Lie, where each sister made three statements, one being false. Their path led them to Golden Mist Village, now inhabited by the spirits of those they once knew. As they defended themselves from these spectral attackers, Illyria accused Sylvanas of manipulating Verissa into assassinating Garrosh Hellscream. This happened in the book War Crimes, where Garrosh was being put on trial for everything he had done, and Verissa wanted revenge for the death of her husband Ronan, who perished in the bombing of Theramor. So Verissa asked Sylvanas for a poison to kill Garrosh, but at the last minute couldn't do it, and Verissa told Anduin, who then saved Garrosh. Sylvanas defended her actions, revealing the plot was Verissa's from the beginning. She blamed Verissa's lack of resolve for the fallout of Garrosh's actions, including the third invasion of the Burning Legion. In a fit of rage, Sylvanas unleashed her banshee powers on the spirit, annihilating it. Illyria, horrified by Sylvanas's savagery, transformed into her void form, declaring that the sister she once knew was lost. During their argument, Verissa attempted to defuse the situation as she did when they were kids, reminding them of their mission to cleanse their home of the undead and revealing the outcomes of their game. Illyria confessed her truths. She missed her sisters and had no regrets about her long absence from Azeroth. Her lie was that she viewed the void as a gift, when in fact she saw it as a relentless struggle she was determined to overcome. Sylvanas, when it was her turn, opted not to continue the game. Illyria told Sylvanas to keep her secrets. Illyria admitted she had come to see if she still had a family, as Lyrith would have wanted her to try. However, it was clear to her that her family was irreparably broken. Illyria then created a void portal to send Verissa home before returning to her son and Turalyon. Section 9. Void Elves In the midst of a looming war with the Horde, King Anduin Wren made a resounding declaration. The Alliance was in dire need of allies. Illyria, a stalwart figure among the Blood Elves of Silvermoon, took this call to heart. She was steadfast in her belief that given the chance, the majority of her kin would willingly sever ties with the Horde and rejoin the Alliance. With this conviction, Illyria embarked on a journey to her homeland. There, she met an old comrade from her Farstrider days, Lorthamar Theron. Time had transformed him into the regent lord of their homeland, a place that had changed almost beyond recognition. Coincidentally, her arrival was mirrored by that of First Arcanist Theresa of the Nightborn, who was also on a quest to forge an alliance with Silvermoon. Lorthamar introduced Illyria as a hero from Silvermoon's past. After exchanging cordial greetings with Theresa and Liadrin, Illyria presented her proposal to the regent. Lorthamar's response was curt, his words tinged with disappointment. He had hoped that Illyria's visit was motivated by love for Silvermoon, not a task for the Boy King, as he put it. The conversation took a bitter turn, with Illyria suggesting that Lorthamar was merely parroting Sylvanas' words, and Lorthamar raising concerns about Illyria's ties to the Void and its inherent dangers. Realizing that her offer had been anticipated and spurned, Illyria readied herself to leave, but before she did, she expressed a desire to see the Sunwell once more. It had been a thousand years from her perspective since she last laid eyes on it. Romoth was against the idea, but Lorthamar overruled him. He declared that no matter what Illyria had become, she was a daughter of Quel'Thalas. He would not deny her the chance to visit their people's most sacred site. When Illyria stood before the Sunwell, she was in awe of its rejuvenation, noting that while it was as she remembered, its energies had evolved. Liadrin confirmed that the well now sustained their people with both the light and the arcane. Suddenly, the plateau was engulfed in void corruption, summoning void beasts, and everyone present sprang into action to prevent the Sunwell's destruction. Illyria battled the creatures, including a formidable void horror named Arun the Darkener, and worked to seal a massive rift portal created by the unseen instigator of the attack. Joining forces with Ramoth and Therisra, Illyria managed to close the rift. However, Romoth blaming her for the attack, angrily demanded her arrest as a saboteur. Lorthamar stepped in, choosing to banish her instead, as her mere presence threatened Quel'Thalas. But before she left, Illyria learned a crucial fact from Romoth. There were Blood Elves practicing the Void who, like her, had been exiled due to the danger the Void posed to the Sunwell. 
Aliri learned a crucial fact from Romoth. There were Blood Elves practicing the Void who, like her, had been exiled due to the danger the Void posed to the Sunwell. Upon her return to Stormwind, Aliri shared the results of her diplomatic efforts with Anduin and disclosed her newfound knowledge about the exiles. She and a champion of the Alliance then embarked on a mission back to Kol Thalas, driven by a sense of empathy for her kin who might be in peril due to the whispers of the Void and the desire to bolster the Alliance's strength with their aid. Arriving in the Ghostlands, Illyria took a moment to reflect on the changes that had occurred in her homeland during her prolonged absence. She followed a breadcrumb trail of information left by Magister Umbruk, a scholar deeply fascinated by the Void and the leader of the Exiles. Through this trail, Illyria uncovered various echoes that shed light on Umbruk's history and motivations. From his conflict with Romoth to his discovery of a Void world that held an object with immense power over the shadows. Upon reaching Dawnstar Spire, Illyria discovered the final piece of Umbruk's narrative and opened a portal to the world she believed he was seeking, known as the Telegross Rift. There she encountered Umbruk, who had heard of her own experiences with the Void and was pleased to meet her. Illyria felt a sense of camaraderie with Umbruk, a fellow outcast from Silvermoon. Umbruk guided Illyria to the artifact he and his followers had discovered and initiated a spell to unleash its power. However, their ritual was abruptly disrupted by Nether Prince Durzan. The Void infected Ethereal who had previously assaulted Illyria at the Sunwell. Durzan, with a sinister intent to corrupt the Blood Elves with the Void, initiated a ritual to strip them of their mortality and lure them into submission. Illyria, filled with fury and a desire to safeguard her kin, engaged in a fierce battle against Durzan, urging her people to resist the whispers of the Void. She also rebuffed Durzan's attempts to persuade her to surrender to the Abyss. Together with the champion, Illyria defeated Durzan and liberated her people, who had been transformed by the Void. Umbrick, now changed by the Shadow, expressed his gratitude to Illyria for saving him from complete madness induced by the Void. Illyria proposed to instruct him and his fellow Elves on how to control the Void, and in return, he and their people, now known as the Void Elves, would pledge their allegiance to the Alliance. Umbrick accepted Illyria's proposition, stating that Silvermoon had abandoned him long ago, and pledged his loyalty to Illyria, who assumed the role of their new leader. Umbrick also became their primary representative to the Alliance. With a sense of victory, Illyria returned to announce her success and the addition to the Void Elves to the Alliance's forces. Telegross Rift was established as the Elves' headquarters, and Illyria's mentor, Locust Walker, journeyed there to assist her in educating and training the Void Elves. Section 10, Battle for Azeroth. During the pivotal battle for Lordaeron, the Gnome and Void Elf forces under the leadership of Gelvin Mechatork and Illyria respectively, made a timely entrance through Void Portals. Turning the tide of the battle against a formidable undead army, Illyria had a personal face-off with Nthanos Blightcaller, and when she and Anduin cornered Sylvanas, Illyria expressed regret for not having eliminated her sister when she had the chance. In a bid to safeguard Azeroth and finally vanquish Sylvanas, Horde rebels under the leadership of Varrock Sourfang, in alliance with the Alliance, prepared to launch an attack on Orgrimmar, establishing their base in Razor Hill. However, before the combined forces of the Horde and Alliance could initiate their assault on Sylvanas' troops, they were joined by Illyria and Verissa. Illyria, sensing the liberation of Nizoth, proposed that Sylvanas' army, potentially the only force capable of defeating the Old God, should be allowed to fight suggesting that the Alliance and Horde Rebels should stand down. Anduin, however, was quick to counter that Sylvanas would not fight for their cause, reminding Illyria that Sylvanas had led both fleets into Queen Najara's trap at a time when the war seemed to be nearing its end. Asserting that they could not wage two wars simultaneously, Anduin insisted that Sylvanas must be defeated here and now, before all hope was lost. Convinced by Anduin's reasoning, Illyria pledged that she and Verissa would scout Sylvanas' lines for vulnerabilities. While Illyria was ready to confront Sylvanas' troops, Varrock Sourfang, viewing Sylvanas' followers as his horde kin and reluctant to shed more horde blood, challenged Sylvanas to a mock duel, meaning duel of honor, which traditionally is a duel to the death, but under Warchief Thrall's rule, it became a non-lethal combat. However, participants can choose to forego this. During the face-off, Sourfang managed to make Sylvanas confess that she saw the Horde as nothing, leading her to quickly kill him and desert the Horde. 
With Sylvanas' departure, the Horde reunited, with her previous loyalists switching sides to Sourfang's revolution. With Sourfang's demise and Sylvanas no longer leading the Horde, the Alliance forces, including Illyria, withdrew from Duratar. Section 11 Shadows Rising King Anduin tasked Illyria and Turalyon with the mission of tracking down Sylvanas, although he was initially disappointed by Illyria's lack of progress. Illyria experienced a chilling vision in which Sylvanas overpowered her using her death powers, nearly choking her to death. Illyria once again lamented her missed opportunity to kill Sylvanas at Windrunner Spire, and then witnessed the death of Turalyon and Erator, before abruptly waking from her nightmare. She later confided in Turalyon about her visions of a thousand futures, each more horrifying than the last, and made a solemn vow to rise above her darkest self in order to thwart her younger sister's plans. During their search, Danath Trollbane brought to their attention that a dark ranger had been spotted among a group of Horde refugees in the Arathi Highlands. After securing the refugees, they were ambushed by Zun, a young orc. Duralia managed to subdue him with a touch of humor, and both agreed to spare him when Gauzes pleaded for her son's life. Illyria, recalling memories of her time with Erator playing in the courtyard of Stormwind Keep, advised Zun, contrary to what he had been taught, war was not about glory but about witnessing people at their worst, and choosing to protect them regardless. While surveying the refugees, Illyria and Turalyon found that their quarry was not among them. However, Illyria's void powers allowed her to sense that Gauzes held the information they needed. Turalyon initially attempted a gentle interrogation of the orc, but after an hour of fruitless questioning, they reluctantly concluded that they needed the information at any cost. Illyria confessed her discomfort at the thought of torturing civilians, but she saw no other viable option, given the urgency of preventing Sylvanas and her followers from causing further harm after the horrors of the Fourth War. When Gauzes defiantly resisted their questioning, Illyria used her void powers to probe her memories and thoughts. This provoked Apothecary Cutley to demand that she stop. He revealed that Vizrin had sworn them to silence and had inadvertently mentioned her plan to head to Falder's Cove to secure a boat. Upon hearing this, Illyria halted her assault and instructed Captain Selasel Nightgiver to provide the refugees with food, blankets, and any other necessities. She also ordered Nightgiver to send Kotli to Stormwind, suspecting that he might know more. Despite the urgency of their mission, Illyria couldn't help but feel a deep sense of regret for the measures she had been forced to take. Armed with fresh intelligence, Illyria and Turalyon set their course for Falder's Cove. There. They encountered a man wielding a dagger that seemed more at home in a Forsaken's grip. When the man proved uncooperative, Turalyon restrained him with the light's power, while Illyria probed his mind. In the midst of their intense interrogation, Jaina Proudmore made her appearance, having been dispatched by Anduin to get an update from the duo. Jaina was taken back by their harsh methods, and when Turalyon defended their actions by revealing the man's connection to a Sylvanas agent, Jaina demanded proof. Turalyon presented the Forsaken Dagger, and Illyria shared her findings from the Mental Probe. The Dark Ranger was en route to Zandalar. Jaina departed to relay this information to Anduin, a move Illyria perceived as snitching. However, Anduin dismissed Jaina's concerns, arguing that the Horde's heinous acts, like the burning of Teldrassil, warranted their extreme measures. He reminded Jaina of her own recent aggressive stance, and expressed his continued faith in Illyria and Turalyon's moral compass. Later, Jaina hosted Turalyon and Illyria in Boralus at Anduin's behest, in case Matthias Shaw found nothing on the Zandalari coast. Their meeting was interrupted by Flynn Fairwind, who brought news of Shaw's capture by the Zandalari Empire. Illyria was quick to suspect a sylvanus zandalari alliance, sparking another heated exchange with Jaina, who cautioned her against fanning the flames of conflict and jeopardizing the treaty. Jaina declared her intention to leverage the treaty before resorting to force against the Horde. Section 12, Shadowlands In the wake of King Anduin's disappearance at the hands of the Mossworn and Turalyon's subsequent elevation to the role of Regent and Guardian of the Kingdom, Illyria made the strategic decision to relocate to the War Room within the imposing walls of Stormwind Keep. Her aim was to bolster the strength of the Alliance, which had been severely tested by recent events. Later, Illyria was among the distinguished alliance leaders who convened with the Horde counterparts in the formidable Bolvar Four Dragon at the Frozen Throne, a chillingly iconic location within the icy confines of Icecrown Citadel. 
During the tumultuous events that unfold in the Shadowlands, Sylvanas experienced a profound reunion with a fragment of her soul that had been lost for an agonizingly long time. Following the ultimate defeat of the Jailer, Illyria and Verisa embarked on a journey to Oribos to bear witness to Sylvanas' trial. In a twist of fate, Sylvanas found herself at the mercy of her sworn enemy, Tyrande Whisperwind. The three sisters, bound by blood and shared history, had only a fleeting moment to say their goodbyes before Tyrande pronounced Sylvanas' fate. A daunting task to cleanse the Maw and liberate all the souls ensnared within its dark depths. Sylvanas accepted her fate with a stoic resolve, sharing a final poignant glance with Illyria and Verisa before plunging into the Maw. In the aftermath, Illyria and Verisa lingered in the Ring of Transference, reflecting on their shared losses and nurturing a fragile hope that Sylvanas might one day complete her penance, allowing for a long-awaited family reunion. In this video, I want to talk about the little brother of the Windrunner sisters, Lyrith Windrunner. He's mentioned in-game according to the internet, but I can't find specific instances of him in-game, minus an easter egg at Windrunner Spire where you see him performing for his three sisters like he did so many years ago. His tale begins at his birth, as it does for anyone. But while it was a joyous day for the whole family, Sylvanas' father's words echoed in her head that day, and they were words she tried very hard to stick to. I will never hurt you, ever, and no one else will either. With love and courage, I will keep you safe. Lyrith was dubbed Little Lord's Son due to his bright blonde hair, but all the children had nicknames of that sort. Sylvanas was dubbed Lady Moon by Illyria. Illyria herself was Lady Sun, and finally, Verisa was Little Moon. Now all three of his sisters are great warriors, great rangers, and he always wanted to follow in their footsteps. Being able to go out and fight to protect his home with them was always a dream of his. But while he wasn't physically strong, he did possess a great skill for music, and he and Sylvanas always had a special bond. She loved her little brother more than she could ever describe. She would fight a thousand trolls single-handedly rather than see harm come to him. In her eyes, it was her job to keep everyone safe with her sisters and his job to entertain them with his incredible musical skills. He would perform at Lord Sathra Hill's gatherings, where his reputation as a musician would grow. And eventually his talent caught the eye of Prince Kaelthos during one of those parties. He was so moved by Lyrith's performance that he arranged for Lyrith to apprentice at Silvermoon's artist quarter. Upon hearing the news, the whole family was excited for him. But Sylvanas was especially relieved that due to him being in Silvermoon and working on his music, he wouldn't be out trying to stop the evils of the world, and she could focus on that and be happy that he was safe. But things weren't all perfect for Lyrith and Silvermoon. Over time, his family would visit him less and less. He would see his father periodically, but he would remark that he has lost his smile as of late. When Sylvanas would come to visit him after a long time, and she had forgotten about his name day, which I take to mean his birthday, which caused Lyrith to feel as if she had forgotten about him and that she just didn't seem to care. But as stated before, that was the furthest thing from the truth. The two ended up having a fight and left Sylvanas upset and unsure of what she could or should have done. She tried to think of what her father would say. He was always the wise one with the phrases that would put things into perspective. Or if Verisa was there, she was one who was good at diffusing situations of that nature. But with just the two of them, it wasn't so easy. People forget things all the time, but when someone important to you forgets things like that, it can hurt more than it normally would. Over time, they would forgive, and the family shared a special moment at their favorite spot they would visit next to a lake. Alira was out doing her ranger duties, and their parents had just left to go out on business. They joked that I missed them already, just as they saw them hop on their dragon hawks and ride off. Verisa had Lyrith's arm around her, and Lyrith invited Sylvanas into the other arm, and Sylvanas just thought, I could never forget you, little lord son. Sadly, after this happy day, grief was right around the corner. They learned their parents had been killed in an ambush. They couldn't believe it, as their mother, being the ranger general, would never fall for an ambush. She was better than that. But in the end, they had to get along with grieving. But it would be easier for some than others. Lyrith was the worst at hiding his emotions, and when he learned of his parents' deaths, he was spurred to want to fight more. To Lyrith, everything felt empty and frivolous now. The world before was a world of softness, of privilege, of wine, song, laughter. But that world is gone now and is never coming back. It is replaced with the reality of war and death. Sylvanas agreed and disagreed with his thoughts. In the present, their world was shattered, and the world of softness and music was gone from this moment and many more in the future. 
but it wasn't gone, never to be seen again. She just wanted him to realize that and hoped her words would sway him to see it. But grief has a way of blinding the truth and can also hurt you in the long run if you make rash decisions. Sylvanas wanted more for him. Her sisters, though, had already known the world could be punishing and violent. The three stood between that darkness and the hard truth, and she wanted Lyrith to not have to do what they had to do. She wanted him to be there for when the world would recover, when their people would rely on the songs and happiness he could bring with his talent. She never wanted him to taste the bitterness that the three of them already knew. Sylvanas tried to make him see reason. Do you know how hard it was on them that all their daughters followed mother's path? A path of danger, of violence, where we could die at any minute? Don't you think they sighed with relief, knowing that at least one of their children might be safe? Don't you think Illyria, Verissa, and I do? It's hard enough having to bury mother and father to mourn them. Do you think I want to bury you? Mourn you? I don't. I won't. And that is why I refuse to teach you. She had valid points. And had Lyrith not been grieving, he may have understood what she was saying and agreed. But that isn't what happened. He went to Verissa and had asked her to train him. She agreed. Feeling it was better to get training from her than someone else, or even try to train on his own. At the end of the day, she just wanted to help her little brother. An attack came to Sylvanas' home by the orcs. She arrived after it was said and done. The family home that had been protected and safe for years, but now was in ruin. With the bodies of their guards and friends all around her, she was desperate to find survivors. She was having no luck, but something stopped her in her tracks. She found a body with an axe in his back, and evidence that he had lived after that attack. It wasn't a quick kill. He was clad in leather armor, not the robes of what her brother would wear. But as she got closer, she saw the hue of his hair, gold as minted coin, and her legs went weak. She got closer and after turning him over, realized it was Lyrith, little lord son. He had tried to help fight off the orcs, but was no match. Whether he had to fight because he had no choice, or he actively got into the battle due to having some training and wanting to help others, isn't clear. But the end result is that Sylvanas didn't know what to do. She hoped it was a dream. Hoped she would wake up from this, and it would just be something she could talk about it with him after. That wasn't the case. As she waited to wake up, the world stood still, and she cradled the one she swore to protect. The one person she would fight a thousand trolls single-handedly to keep safe. But here he was, gone, and all she could do was think of the vow she took to herself when he was a baby, in the words of her father, I will never hurt you, ever, and no one else will either. With love and courage, I will keep you safe. She's broken that vow twice now, once with her words, and today, but now there's no chance for reconciliation, or the chance to apologize. She just sat there, cradling him as she did when he was a baby in the afternoon sunshine and remained still and silent as the world went on. As she was cradling him, she noticed the trail showing he tried to get away to safety as his life came to an end, and making the situation that much worse. After being laid next to his parents, Sylvanas wanted nothing but revenge. She said that whoever trained him, whoever indulged his fantasy to be a warrior was to blame, as much as the one who buried the axe in his back. Sadly, she didn't have to look far for the culprit. Verissa admitted she trained him. She was just trying to help him but Sylvanas was having none of it. She told Lorthamar to keep Verissa away from her, perhaps forever. Now this story personally hit me close to home, having dealt with the loss of someone who passed suddenly due to their own design. The feelings that Christy Golden describes hit me right in the heart, and everything that she described is spot on for what I went through. The anger that Sylvanas felt, the guilt, the questions, everything. It isn't a wound that ever heals. I wasn't sure how many people knew the full story of him, and there is more in the Sylvanas book, but I just wanted to give more of a brief overview. But there's a lot more conversation between him and the family and Sylvanas that really, really drive home all of it. And I personally listened to the audiobook with Patty Matson narrating it, and she did fantastic. I would definitely recommend it, if nothing else, just for her narration. It was very well done. But I wanted to highlight him and the fact that his death is what has Sylvanas and Illyria on a rage to kill the orcs and just want them all dead. Obviously Verissa was mad as well, but I didn't remember reading any mention of her having as much of a bloodlust as her other two sisters. It could be that she felt more guilt than anything due to training him, 
but she was only doing it out of love. Just as Sylvanas was not training him because she wanted to protect him from the fight. Either way, I thought it was interesting to see that side of Sylvanas and know more about a character that really isn't mentioned in the game. Denneth Trollbane was a seasoned mercenary captain in the Stormguard Militia at the start of the Second War. He rose to become General Turalyon's tactical advisor during the conflict. He gained renown for his leadership skills during the decisive battle to free Kazmadan, earning him a reputation as one of Stormguard's most esteemed warriors and a prominent veteran of the war. His exceptional abilities as a general and combatant led to his appointment as overseer of the Orc internment camps in Azeroth with his headquarters located at Stormwind. He was called upon to reinforce Nethergard Keep when the Horde reopened the Dark Portal. Leading his forces from Stormwind, he headed to Nethergard, but was ambushed by the Death Knights and the new Warsong clan. Realizing that the Horde would win the battle, his men sacrificed themselves so that he could warn Khadgar, the wizard in charge of Nethergard. Despite his desire to stay with his men, he knew he had to fulfill their sacrifice and rode to Nethergard which was under siege by the Warsong clan, led by Gramash Hellscream. They were eventually relieved by General Turalyon, his friend and commander. For the rest of his days, he would carry the guilt of leading and abandoning his boys, as he fondly referred to them as, to be mercilessly slaughtered. When Nerzul took the Book of Medivh and other items to Draenor, he joined the Alliance expedition as second-in-command and tactical advisor to General Turalyon. After capturing Hellfire Citadel, he led half of the expedition along with Kurdren Wildhammer's Griffin Riders and half of Illyria's rangers in pursuit of Nerzul. During the chase, Curtin was struck down by Nerzul, fueling Daneth's rage. He wanted to launch a full attack on Akendun, where the Horde had taken refuge, but was advised by Tathrasar to calm down. While waiting, he and Tathrasar encountered the Erekoa Grizzik, who informed them that Curdrin was still alive. They followed Grizzik into the tunnels of Akendun, where they met the Draenei priest Nemoran, Convincing Nemoran that they were there to rid the Temple of Orcs, Danath and his allies fought alongside the Draenei against the Orcs. This marked the first time humans, elves, dwarves, and Draenei fought together. After rescuing Kurdren, he faced off against Kilrog Denai, a renowned Orc chieftain who stood in their way to Nerzul. After a fierce but honorable duel, he emerged victorious. But Nerzul had already escaped. He then joined Turalyon in the Siege of the Black Temple, where Nerzul was opening new portals. As Draenor began to tear apart, he and his comrades defended Khadgar while he closed the Dark Portal to Azeroth. They then disappeared into one of the rifts created by Nerzul to escape the dying world. Danas Trollbane's legacy lives on, as he and the other leaders from the Expeditionary Force have been immortalized in stone in the Valley of Heroes in Stormwind. In Burning Crusade, you learn that he and his men have survived the cataclysm that created Outland and now reside at Honorhold a stronghold that has stood since before the sealing of the portal. Honorhold was left to fend for itself in the battle against the Burning Legion and the fell orcs of Mac Veridon, until Lord Kazakh reopened the portal many years later. Daneth, along with the rest of the Alliance forces, were presumed dead by those who remained on Azeroth. However, it was revealed that many of them, including Daneth, were still alive. With General Turalyon missing, he has taken on the leadership of the Sons of Lothar in Turalyon's absence. Reunited with the Alliance, he has welcomed much needed supplies and reinforcements from Stormwind and Nethergard. Through these reinforcements, he has learned of the fate of his beloved Stormguard, which was destroyed during the events of the Third War. Once his duty in Outland is complete, he hopes to return to Stormguard and restore it to its former glory. He is the last of the five leaders of the expedition who remains at Honorhold. Khadgar has settled in Shatroth after his journeys to other worlds, while Kurdrin and most of the Wildhammer clan have established a base in Shadowmoon Valley. He has not heard from Turalyon or Illyria in over a decade. Erator, the son of Turalyon and Illyria, has accompanied the Alliance reinforcements and visited Danath in search of his parents. Danath informed him that his father has been missing for a long time. Now in Cataclysm you don't actually see Danath anywhere, but you do get a hint of his return. His return was teased when players would talk to Skuerto, in which he would say, I'm sick of sitting in this hole. I hope whatever pencil pusher is holding up Dennis' return gets a punch in the jimmies. But he doesn't return until Legion. Now in Legion, Dennis made a triumphant return during the third invasion of the Burning Legion, taking on the role of a quest starter for the warrior artifacts. While on a reconnaissance flight above the broken shore with an alliance warrior, he was unfortunately struck by Legion's siege weapons and disappeared after his griffin fell towards the sea. However, 
he assured the player that he would find an alternative way back. Later on, Danith can be found at a hero's welcome, where he reflects on his close encounters with demons and vows that they will not get a third chance to take him down. If the player is a warrior, he expresses his relief at their survival and states that he never doubted them. He also mentions that he will soon return to the front lines. When it is revealed that Illyria and Turalyon are still alive, Gadgar reunites with them on Argus, the homeworld of the Burning Legion. During their reunion, Cadgar informs him that both Kurdran and Danath are still alive, although he admits that he doesn't get to see them as often as he would like. The three of them make plans for a reunion feast once the fighting is over, a celebration of the Sons of Lothar's resilience and victory. Each Hallow's End, a haunting voice reverberates across the heavens. Prepare yourselves! The bells have tolled! Shelter your weak, your young, and your old! Each of you shall pay the final sum! Cry for mercy! The reckoning has come! <laughs> the sky is dark! The fire burns! You strive in vain as fate's wheel turns! But what's his story? What led to his current form? Was he always unhinged? Today we unravel the mystery behind the creation of the Headless Horseman. In the shadowy lands of Tiris Fall Glades, just a stone's throw from Agamond Mills, resided Thomas Thompson and his kin, proprietors of a thriving pumpkin farm. As a paladin, he was among those who bore witness to and agreed with the refusal of Uther the Lightbringer and Jaina Proudmoore to accept Prince Arthas's drastic plan to cleanse Stratholme. He was a silent observer as the Scourge wrecked havoc on Lordaeron, and was present when Baron Rivendare treacherously dispatched a shipment of infected grain to a village under his protection. News reached him of Prince Arthas's return from Northrend and the subsequent murder of his father. Thomas was convinced that the seeds of this heinous act were sown much earlier, perhaps as far back as the Stratholme incident. A mere five days later, he learned of the tragic demise of Uther and the loss of numerous fellow paladins at the hands of Arthas. In a desperate bid to ensure his family's safety, he instructed his wife and two children to seek refuge in Kalimdor, following Jaina, while he stayed behind in Lordaeron with the Silver Hand, vowing to vanquish the Scourge. Over the ensuing four years, Thomas, along with other paladins under the banner of the Ashbringer, Alexandros Mograine, waged a relentless war against the Scourge, under the guidance of Satan Dathraham, a man he greatly admired. However, the Silver Hand was shattered when Renault Mograine killed his father with the Ashbringer, leading to the founding members of the Argent Dawn departing, swayed by High Inquisitor Fairbanks' account. Undeterred, Thomas chose to align himself with the Scarlet Crusade. In a fateful day, Satan Datherhand guided Thomas and his companions to a refugee-filled town, where they were welcomed under the pretense of a routine plague inspection. Gradually, Datherhand persuaded Thomas that the townsfolk were infected, and unlike the incident at Stratholm, Thomas participated in the massacre of the refugees. In a tragic twist of fate, he unknowingly slew his own family, his daughter's face turning towards him just as his blade ended her life. He surmised that the ship he had sent them on to Kalimdor must have been caught in an early storm, damaging it before it could set sail. With Lord Ron in turmoil, there would have been no craftsmen to mend the ship, and the remaining vessels would have been overcrowded, forcing the displaced passengers to seek shelter wherever possible. Shattered by his actions, he was returned to the Scarlet Monastery where he eventually lost his sanity, convinced the entire world was infected and communicating in verse. He believed he was the sole savior. After slaying many of his former allies on Hallow's End, he was confronted and decapitated. Datherhand chose to honor the fallen crusader with a dignified burial. Once the tomb was sealed and he was alone with the body, Datherhand, who was in reality Balazar, a dreadlord, masquerading as the deceased general, used his own blood and demonic energies to resurrect Thomas's corpse, thus creating the Headless Horseman, a being with his own deranged free will. There is a quest you can do to put the horseman at peace and be reunited with his family. For the Horde, it starts outside of Undercity, and you talk to Orphan Matron Nanny. For the Alliance, you talk to Matron Mother Seekel, which she is outside of Stormwind. When you talk to either of them, you get told that the spirit of Thomas Thompson has called for you and is seeking your help. You get told to go to Scarlet Monastery to locate his spirit and see how you can help. Upon reaching the monastery, Sir Thomas remarks, The Scarlet Monastery. It appears I am not yet able to leave this dreadful place behind. After accepting the subsequent quest, it is revealed that his wife's spirit is missing. 
As Hollow's End draws near, the spirits haunting the monastery emerge from the shadows, and he hopes to find answers among them regarding his wife's fate. As you traverse the monastery, various shades are seen reliving their nightmares. Initially, you approach a crusader terrified of the infection spreading from the grain in the area. Upon confronting the crusader, a shade of fear materializes, which you must defeat. Two more shades appear when confronting spirits, the shade of deception when you confront the shade of Dathrahan, and finally, a shade impersonating Thomas's wife, Susanna, the shade of guilt. After defeating the final shade, a thoughtful Thomas rushes ahead. When you catch up to him, Thomas has a new lead. He recalls a fountain where he used to take his wife before the Scourge invasion, a place where he felt confident in himself, in the light, and in his family. As you approach the glowing orb near the fountain, a trap is sprung, ensnaring Thomas. The trap was set by Jerome Hayton, and to free Thomas, you must destroy three soul stones scattered in the area. In the process, you discover that Jerome was part of Dathrahan's inner circle, but it seems Jerome was unaware that Dathrahan was possessed by a dreadlord. After you successfully free Thomas, it's too late. He transforms back into the horseman, galloping away into the monastery. Susanna returns to the fountain and kneels beside it. When you converse with her, you discover that on the night he urged her and her children to flee to Kalimdor, he hadn't retired to bed, but was standing guard to protect them, and his eyes reflected desperation. She vows not to abandon him, not now, not ever again. In the final part of the quest chain, Susanna requests your assistance to enter the monastery with her, confront the horseman, and liberate her husband from the curse that plagues him. Upon entering the monastery, you summon the horseman. If you wish, you can interact with the wicker statues at the beginning of the instance to increase the difficulty level, and also you can get an achievement for it. However, in this case, I chose not to do it due to my inadequate gear and the fact that it's my first time tanking in a while. After defeating the horseman, you have freed Thomas, allowing him to reunite with his family and finally rest. It is done. The headless horseman is no more. Then let us rest, my love. At long last. My family is whole again. As is my soul. I cannot thank you enough, champions. And that's the story of the Headless Horseman. Hopefully you did enjoy. I'll see you in the next one. Take care of yourself. And before we end off the video, I just wanted to say this real quick. If you're going through a hard time right now, put your head down and power forward. You're doing great. Keep it up. I'll see you in the next one. And do take care of yourself.